Erev Tov, good evening. I'll start Hebrew, then I'll go to English. We have a special guest tonight, but uh, we are in Israel University, so I would like to welcome you in Hebrew. אז ברוכים הבאים שוב לקמפוס של האוניברסיטה הפתוחה על שם דורותי דה רוטשילד, למפגש נוסף של מועדון ה-Open New Club שלנו. אני מזכיר לכם אותו מועדון של יזמות ועסקים לבוגרי ה-Op. המפגשים האלה כבר יצרו מסורת ארוכה, אני חושב. השולחן העגול שסיימנו לא מזמן היה מפגש שני. אנחנו רוצים להמשיך את השולחן העגול, ואתם בהחלט מוזמנים להציע רעיונות כדי שיהיו לנו שולחנות עגולים בשכיחות גבוהה, לפחות כמו המפגשים האלה שאנחנו מקיימים איתכם. כדאי שהשולחן העגול גם יהיה בצמוד לכנס עצמו, ואז נפיק את התועלת באינטראקציות האלה. דני מחכה לשמוע רעיונות מכם, אז קדימה, לשלוח רעיונות, אנחנו מחכים לקבל הצעות. מטרת המועדון, אני מזכיר לכם, לקדם ולהשאיר את התרבות היזמית ואת החינוך האלה יזמות בקרב תלמידי בוגרי האוניברסיטה הפתוחה, וכמובן לעודד הקמת מיזמים. הערב בשולחן העגול נחשפנו לשלושה מיזמים מעניינים. אני חושב שגם המציגים קיבלו פידבק מהנוכחים עצמם ונתנו להם כיווני דרך וכיווני חשיבה, ואין לי ספק שהם עצמם יפיקו תועלת מהאינטראקציה שנוצרה מסביב לשולחן שישבנו בו. יש לנו אורח של כבוד ואני חושב שזה בהחלט פריצה דרך למפגשים שלנו. האורח שלנו הוא ג'ף פולבר, יזם ואיש עסקים. שעוסק בטלפוניה דרך תקשורת נתונים, אביו ה-IP. הוא עצמו הוכתר על ידי מגזין מאוד מוביל, ה-Business Week, כגורו של הטכנולוגיה. הוא עושה שימוש בעת האחרונה גם בטוויטר וגם בפייסבוק, ובסך הכל נדמה לי שכל מי שיושב כאן שמע ומכיר את האיש ואת פועלו. אני חייב מילים אחת באנגלית לטובת האורח, ואגב, הוא עצמו לא יוכל לדבר איתכם עברית מטבע הדברים, אז אני כבר מכין אתכם להרצאה עצמה. So we are very happy to have uh, here Jeff Pulver tonight as our uh, note speaker. Uh, Jeff Pulver, entrepreneur, chairman and founder of uh, Pulver.com, and the pioneer of the VIP industry. leader in emerging TV on the net industry. Jeff's expertise is widely utilized through the communication and internet industries, and uh, which is now extended into the critical public policy arena. He himself uh, took some work with the FCC, International Telecommunication Union, and the United States Congress, and uh, he has been notified as the tech guru by the business week. Mr. Pulver is committed to the future of the IP communication. Tonight, we'll have him as our note speaker, and he'll give us a lecture about the next communication revolution, microblogging and state of now. Jeff Pulver, please. Good evening. Thanks for uh, inviting me to be here. Just curious, um, how many people here are uh, active, currently active on Facebook? Good. And um, how many people here uh, currently use Twitter? Everyone else, while I'm talking, you might want to sign up. Uh, and uh, how many people here are currently using um, uh, uh, Foursquare? How many? One, two. I know you two. And you? That's it? So you, if we actually, if you can actually download Foursquare while, if you have a, how many of you have smartphones? Good. So while I'm talking, go to foursquare.com and download the application, because if you all download and sign in while I'm talking, my friends in the front row will qualify for the Swarm Badge. And uh, you'll understand what this is a little later, but it's, if we can actually form a swarm, it will probably be the first swarm in Israel, um, or any, you know, really, so that'd be kind of cool. So... Um, As far as what I was talking about uh, this evening, uh, you know, microblogging is something which I think is kind of passe. In fact, I think um, uh, social media doesn't even matter anymore. I, I think that it's a uh, word that's been overused so much that it has no meaning at all. Um, but the state of now is something which I kind of like. It's uh, my representation of the emerging real-time Internet. So just curious, how many people here were active on the Internet in the, like the mid to late 90s, like from 93 to 96? 
And uh, I'll just argue that if you weren't, you probably wish you were, because there was tremendous opportunity in terms of um, ideas that came out and in terms of uh, businesses that were started. And before there was a dot-com, uh, before there was a bubble, there was nothing but uh, endless opportunity in, in what's happening. Uh, my background is varied. Uh, I, I range from being an uh, unemployed accountant to a, uh, someone who doesn't uh, understand what he, he can't do, so he just does stuff. In, in the world of communications, I've um, been a, in the communications field my entire life as much as anyone in this room has been. Uh, my first experiences with media that was social was when I was a, uh, nine years old, when I um, first experienced amateur radio and spent three years of my life obsessed with getting an amateur radio license. But if you can imagine needing to take a license to go on the internet, that's what I was like when I was a kid trying to have, to, 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 what ended up discovering my voice and, and having a license to communicate. And that throughout my entire life, I've always liked to connect with people with, uh, with amateur radio, it was almost pretty simple because you could say CQ, CQ, and give out a... How many people here are ham radio operators? A new one? No, one or two. All right. So what amateur radio offered, more than it offers, since it's not too popular anymore, is a platform for anonymous communications to just happen. You, no one actually has, has to know who you are, although you do tell them your name, and usually you're authentic in terms of who you are. You usually tell them the location you're in, although you don't have to. And you find conversations which have, which have absolutely maybe no meaning to anyone else other than yourself and the person you're talking to. Because typically when you say hello, it's like, and I learned how to do this like in 10 languages. But I could say, say you know, Smee Jeff, and he got up in New York, and that's about it. And then um, and go on to the next conversation. And uh, it's, hi, Smee Jeff. Uh, and then I might give a, a report of how, how strong the signal was, so, so that how loud the person was. Because people took very big pride in their antennas. People took great pride in their designs in terms of uh, how their voice was sounding. And um, this was my life for a long time, in terms of connecting with people, very superficially at times. But at the same time, I started to actually establish relationships so that I could turn the radio dial on, tune around, and without listening to someone's identification, I knew who they were. I knew their story. I knew, I knew where uh, my friends were, wherever they were in the world. And depending upon the year, time of year, I knew that whether or not I'd be listening to my friends in Israel speak in the afternoon to me, whether my friends from Australia were going to come in at night, well, there I was going to be sick, just tired of listening to my friends from New York City. But there was, a, there was a bond that was formed and a relationship that was formed, and there was this uh, absolute trust that was there. And that if I spoke to somebody on the radio, it was, it was, they were trustworthy by default. It wasn't like they had to earn my trust. It was part of it. And I say all this because these days on the Internet, you know, the Internet was built on trust. Uh, Anyone here um, IP engineers, right? So one of the biggest problems you have had since, since the IP protocols came out was defending, about, uh, defending the cluelessness for the, my, my friends Vin Cerf and others who designed protocols that were by, by default trustworthy because we all believed that we, we were good people and that no one's going to do anything evil and we were just good. And when you look at how communications evolved, you know, for me, I spent a long time uh, talking on radios as a way to find people because when I was in school, I didn't have very many friends. So I would actually spend 40 to 60 hours a week uh, on my radio uh, discovering new people, new civilizations, new whatevers. And it was actually uh, a kind of fun. And while in my life I never really met too many of these people who I spoke on the radio, a lot of them changed my life, affected me in ways that are hard to explain. But one of my first experiences in it with Israel, in fact, came in 1977 when I first got my ham radio license. I speak to a guy who's a, a Bazet Aba UX, 4Z4UX, and he said his name was Danny, and he lived in Ramat Aviv. I found out he lived on 6 Baron Hurst Street. I found his phone number was like 03415127. I don't know why I know that. But, um, but a friend of mine, uh, and, he, and a friend of mine that summer was coming to Israel for the first time, and he says, oh, any friend of yours, you should you know, send him over. And then I got a postcard from my friend, from my friend Sandy who went to see him who told me that um, something was up with this guy, Danny. His, his family seemed to be very patriotic, but he had to go through a metal detector to go into the guy's apartment. And then he said, um, you know, sent me another postcard later that summer saying, um, did you check out how Danny spells his name? And because he said his name was Danny Mayer. So it's like, no. So anyway, it turns out, look. So it turns out, I, I knew his name was Danny Mayer. 
as Gold, one of Golda Meir's grandsons. And at the time, Golda was living in the apartment where my friend was living too. And, but that was sort of the openness that was available. And ever since then, I've been connected. That was sort of like a, the first time I felt connected to anything. And it, ha- and it happened on the radio. And those types of relationships where people just open up themselves into your lives is very much equivalent to what happens on the internet today. I mean, for many people anyway, particularly people who are being social. But for me, I went through a phase of um, using these t- t- communication platforms to discover who I was. And it became a foundation for my life. I also did some silly things like ran a pirate radio station, which was a good thing to do if you had nothing to do. And I found that I liked music. I, made, I became a DJ when I was a teenager, and I used that as an excuse to meet women, since the only way I was meeting people was by booking gigs at parties. So, but it worked out okay. And then, but the, what, what, uh, the humili- what, what, in 12th grade, when I was uh, um, in school, we had an English teacher, and I had to write a story. Everyone had to write a story about the me that nobody knows. So in 12th grade, I wrote this confessional. I wrote about the fact that I was a pirate radio, st- that, I, that I created a pirate radio station when I was in high school, and how I enjoyed operating the pirate radio when it was uh, on cold winter nights in New York City when it was stormy, or on federal holidays because I didn't think the Federal Communication Commission would come out after me. And it was frustrating because no, neither my teacher nor, nor anyone in my class actually believed me. No one believed that I actually could actually do this, but I had the, set to, the, the, the mindset to try that out, and it was... For me, interesting, because when you look at how we communicate, how people communicate, how you connect as individuals, you know, you have friends, you have relatives, you have people you went to high school with, or people you went to junior high school with, and then you have actually people who are meaningful in your life, and not everyone always falls into into the categories. Sometimes there are people that you're really enemies with, but somehow you have to pretend to be friends. Then there are people, of course, who um, you're really curious about, you're a fan of, or otherwise not really sure why you want to know about it, but these are all people that always exist. It's not like when Facebook first happened, you had all these categories of relationships. These are things that are actually always there. With amateur radio, it was pretty simple. Either people were geeks or they were not. If they weren't geeks, they weren't on the radio. If they were, well, you could find them anywhere in the world. And when um, my life happened, so I, so I went through this time where I was on the radio. That was sort of my foundation for communicating. And I played with packet-based communication, email, if you will, back in 1979. I, I did all these really interesting things that I thought were cool, but no one else knew about or cared about. Um, and then um, I made the mistake, of, well, I went to college. Uh, I had a big fight with my family, but I went to college. I got an accounting degree. I pity any of you who actually practice accounting. Um, I, I never made it. I, I, I'm an unemployed accountant. I, uh, I'm a lazy person in the sense that I only wanted a degree that I could, I needed a degree that I could only had needed one degree for. And at the, t- the, the school I went to at the time was number six in America for recruiting into the top accounting firms. So it was respectable to have that degree. And I ended up um, that, so- I became a, I started a software company. And one thing led to another and I became an expert at fixed income mathematics. I worked on Wall Street. And um, somehow I ended up uh, working, at the, when I was working on Wall Street is when voice, when voice over IP happened. And this, the first time I was really feeling this communication revolution wasn't so much email but was when I rediscovered amateur radio. Um, anybody here ever use iPhone? Not the, the original iPhone, not the Apple iPhone. A few of you, yeah. Well, and so, so in February 1995, when iPhone came, was at first available from Vocal Tech and Herzliya, I was one of the first people to download it, and that my, my social media identity back then was WA2BOT. Uh, we are to be on time. We are Beatles, WA2 Beatles on tour, Big on Toast. That's my ham radio call sign. It's, a, it's the name the U.S. government gave me, and so... Myself and about 20% of the people who were online that day were using their social media, identi- their, their amateur radio call signs as their IDs. And what was very strange was that we were not using radio. We were actually talking to a computer. We had no antennas. We had no big microphones. We had no propagation. We had software, connectivity, um, and a computer. But what I realized is that the, the communi- there was a communication revolution that was going to happen. And the biggest takeaway for me was that voice is no longer a service, that we now could have, we can now, applications will now enable people to communicate without the need for service providers. This is a very powerful statement. This represents the, one of the biggest fears of, every, of any incumbent company, particularly whether it was Bezek here in Israel, whether it was AT&T in America, whether it was BT, because these people, uh, uh, people who are born into monopolies, believe that they can um, charge whatever they want to forever, and that they, have, that they are the gatekeepers of your life. They're a good utility. 
And um, I accidentally, and I don't need to go into it now, but I, I accidentally helped popularize the idea of using voice on the internet, not so much to bypass the phone companies, but ultimately we transitioned what was a wire, one form of technology completely IP based, and it was interesting. Um, and that I was finding myself being social again, first with voice, the same way I was being social with um, uh, on amateur radio in terms of relationships, in terms of connecting with people. And the, uh, the mindset was different, but, but the, the results were the same. And I, I had a, li a few life lessons, which uh, I guess are important. One of them is if uh, you get fired, it can save your life. You see, I, 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 we used to work in the World Trade Center. I, I started working there actually six months after they tried to blow it up the first time. And, and my obsession with voice over IP actually got me fired. Uh, for, it almost got me fired right when it came out, but I got away from that. But a year later, you know, I had, we had an, I, I don't, anybody here working systems in IT? Anyone? Anyone? So we had, you know, my, my, I worked in a thousand person company. There were 125 people in systems. We had two bosses. And every six months we had a reorg. And uh, I got fired because I came back from vacation. They had an all hands on meeting. And I walked into, everyone got the uh, org chart. I walked into the meeting. I said, oh shit because I looked at the org chart and I wasn't on it because uh, the people forgot to fire me. Um, and that summer, well, that, and that turned out to be okay to be fired because that summer I, had not, I could not figure out what to do for the rest of my life. I was sort of on the edge. Uh, biggest thing my parents didn't do was help me when I got fired. And I had a, a young family and no savings and I didn't know what to do. And I spent 10 weeks or so, what ended up working on my first conference which was about voice and um, uh, video on the internet. It was called uh, The Talking Net. It was held in New York City uh, on September 10th and 11th, 1996. And I was hoping that 40 or 50 people would show up. What was crazy was, and I had no way to market this. I had no mailing lists, I, and I knew nothing about events. I mean, and I financed this entire event by going to the JFK. I found a, took out my Optima card from American Express. I took, I borrowed $15,000 I didn't have, and I used that to put down the deposits for my conference. And Lo and behold, 224 people showed up from all over the world. And within two years, five or six of these people were billionaires on paper, which is kind of crazy. But what we discovered was this whole new revolution of communication. The it was a fear, the greed, the disruption, and the opportunity of, um, of connecting people with people. And so I ended up, because I had nothing else to do, I ended up creating what became a trade show and conference and a community to help foster the uh, revol revolution for voice on the internet. And so you know, when I first look at social media and, and see all the hype we have where it is today, I, I think it's bullshit because I think that anyone who's ever been social in school, anyone who's ever been social in expressing themselves, they're all experts already in social media. You know, the fact that we take a phrase and popularize it by saying doing something is nice, except when things become unpopular, it's not so cool to be in that field. With voice on the internet, it happened. It peaked twice. That voice over IP was hot, and then it became cold as anything. Then it became hot again, and when it became cold again, it was like people had to redefine what they did for a living. And I, I didn't really go for that too much. But um, while I was doing the internet um, voice shows, I also started Vonage, which was the first, became the first broadband telephone company. Um, and I did a bunch of other things all by accident because you know if you, I learned a hard life lesson that. If you don't know what you're doing, you could do anything. But if you have people around you that tell you things can't happen, it's crazy, things can't happen. And that if you're actually trying to figure out the future, it's better not to know what your limitations are. And whenever I've started, I've started about 50 companies or so, failed at many of them. But what I discovered is that we sometimes make good mistakes. And except for deep research, when we do medis deep medical research, it's the good mistakes that we make that sometimes bring forward change that changes all of us. It affects us in a very meaningful way. Um, and so for my own purposes, uh, I was totally clueless. In fact, I'm happy to tell you I continue to be clueless. But I, I have had fun playing with the governments. Uh, in, in 1996, a group of phone companies got together in America to ban the sale and use of the software from Vocal Tech and other companies. They wanted to make it so that if you made such software, you were regulated like a telephone company, and that you, and then it should be banned, its use should be banned in America. And somehow, I managed to create a trade association without knowing how to do it in 10 days. And for nine years, we were successful in the United States and around the world to keep voice on the internet regulation free. 
by simply bringing people together virtually via email. It was just the silliest thing. And then in like 2003, um, I woke up one day and I thought that we need to protect the future. And I went to Washington and uh, through some fun stories, I actually ended up getting a law which was passed a year later that, that stated that voice communication on the broadband internet that doesn't touch the legacy phone network and ends up on, on broadband is not telecom. And that was called the pulver order. And of all the things I ever did, I think that was the thing I'm sort of most proud of. Um, so then I got to go to Stanford Business School and they wrote a case study about me and I realized how stupid I really was. And, and it, was, it was very frustrating because they presented the case study to the class and I had to sit on my hands. Little, the, prof the two professors told me to sit on my hands for an hour. <laughs> Um, literally, and I, and I had to, and I know, I realized why they meant that, because there were so many times I wanted to jump up and say something, I had to be anonymous in the class, and then spend the last 30, day, 30 minutes of the class answering the questions, doing Q&A with the students, who had these brilliant ideas for what I should have done, and I, I wish I could have done those, but it, it was fun, it was, uh, it, and you know, what I discovered through all this is that you know, the, the revolutions that we see happen on the internet, they come in waves, but what's really more interesting are the waves. It's just how people adapt to these things. And that you know, so often people do something and all of a sudden everyone else wants to do that. And, and rather than, you know, the, the hard part is seeing the future and, and acting on it without anyone telling you you're great or smart or, or for that matter, fighting people who think you're stupid. You know, as a, as a person who was growing up, one of the hardest things I ever had to deal with were my friends that would tell me whenever I had an idea for a company or for, an, for a business or for a project, people would tell me, no, 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 don't do it, it's stupid. And I was silly enough to listen. And what I discovered as I got older is that what was worse than having people who tell me no were the people when I used to, when I built up a company, all the people used to tell me yes. But it turns out having no people around, having the people say no around you too much is not good. People who tell you yes too much is not good. And that you eventually, if you could find your own voice and figure out where things are at, there's so much more that happens. But for me as a kid, but you know, and I don't know if any any of you have ever actually remember being nine years old. I don't know if any of you remember or ever experienced being lonely. But I believe it's the loneliness that one feels as a young age, if you do feel lonely or ever did, that sort of propels you into the future. And for me, amateur radio was my safety net. It was the way I was able to reach out from my bedroom in my house and find friends. Whether they were fictional or not, these were people and voices that became very, very strong, um, prominently parts of my life. And I, didn't, I can turn on my ham radio, say CQ, CQ, this is WA2BOT calling CQ, and repeat it until my sisters complained. But every once in a while, someone would hear my voice and they would start having a conversation. And I really didn't have to say anything meaningful, although sometimes we did. And I would say I was from New York, or I said my name was Jeff, I really didn't say how old I was, I didn't say what I did for a living, because I didn't do anything for a living. <laughs> and, and, I, and I met people who were ambassadors and consulates and met people from all these different countries. And all I remembered was the by default niceness of these people, the friendliness, the ruach, was just so, so pleasant. And so I grew up in that type of world, and it was kind of cool. And then I'd go to school, and it'd be kind of cruel, because I was sort of invisible again. I had this conflict between having a voice that I could say hi to people and connect with people almost anywhere, and a voice which was never heard because I was so alone and so by myself. And um, this was sort of my dilemma. And so that's sort of where that was. And so how many people here follow me on Twitter? I'm curious. Anyone? Anyone? A few of you do. Do you ever see me say uh, hello, good morning? You notice my good morning tweets? You don't know why I say good morning? So that's instead of me saying CQ, CQ, this is WA2BOT calling CQ and standing by. I discovered that in the last year and a half, the world became flat. That 500 years post-Columbus, we're now living in a time where... Um, the world actually became flat in the sense that when it's um, 6 in the morning in New York, I know it's 11 o'clock in the morning in London, I know it's noon in Paris, it's 1 in the afternoon in Tel Aviv, and it's 6 o'clock at night in Perth, Australia. When I say good morning, friends of mine or people who just know about me respond back anonymously, well, well I mean, they're anonymous, I don't know who, the, half the people I never know who they are, the other half are friends. And I start, this, I start each day with a conversation and it kind of like brings me back to a point of time and just understanding that there are people out there, that there are voices waiting to be connected to and that there's an opportunity to, to, to feel the presence of people and strangers and that you really don't know this, but it's the very little things you say to someone sometimes has a major impact on someone's mood, a major impact, a lifeline sometimes. I mean, I've, I've been on the edge of 
of a deep depression or absolute joy and connecting with people, sometimes it's the strangest of things will trigger me and, and take me out of mood swings or inspire me to do things. And it's just an amazing world out there that Twitter has become for me, I don't look at it as a microblogging platform. I actually look at it as sort of an extension of amateur radio in the sense that it, it, it has become a, the two-way radio of the internet in a way that um, I never would have believed it to be. And I, I never thought it could be. I mean, Facebook, is, so you're all on Facebook. How many people here have, uh, are tar have certain friends whose status updates you're, you're tired of seeing on Facebook? Anyone? Right? Oh, come on. I'm sure there are others. And, and when you like it on Facebook, if you can set your status message to one thing, to one friend, and send, send it something else to everybody else, which you probably do, just don't realize it. Um, <laughs> You know, you're living in a world right now of what I'll call hyper-communications that, in fact, five years ago, you didn't give a damn about what certain people were doing, whether they were your friends, your frenemies, your cousins that you didn't know about, friends from high school who you really didn't care about, or anyone else. In the last five years, you've now connected and created networks where these people are now part of your lives. And some of them, maybe you have relationships, maybe you, you rekindled stuff that was brewing a long time ago. Or maybe it's just nice to see certain friendly faces. Five years from now, you're going to be suffering from this because we, you're going to all start to suffer soon from what I'll say is too much asynchronous communication overload. The amount of filtering that's available on your digital life, the tools that are not evolving fast enough for, you, for the way that you're connecting as people, and that this will have severe issues with your ability to, for connectedness. I mean, how many people here on average spend at least uh, four hours a day on, online? How many people are six hours a day? Okay, see this? Uh, eight hours a day if you could? Ten hours if you could? Fourteen hours a day on average is me, sometimes 16. This means I don't have a life, right? Uh, this means that when I go off broadband for periods of time that people think are normal, like to drive someplace, I start to jitter. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know and if, and if Israel is a problem, but you know, in America, you know, we have a campaign that says, friends don't let friends drive uh, drunk. It, it, I'm pushing in America for friends don't let friends text when they're driving. Friends don't let friends update their Facebook status when they're driving. Friends don't let friends shoot video and post it live on YouTube when driving. <laughs> but, but this is happening. You know, I have kids that will be 16 soon, which is crazy. And when they were like eight or nine years old, I got them Game Boys. I used to tell them, don't play your game. Um, we would be walking down the street and could and look up. And the thing is that they sometimes didn't look up and then they would fall. It's like it made me feel bad. And now, of course, you know, they're, they're texting and they're, it's the same thing, right? But it's not just them, it's the parents. If you ever go into Manhattan on Fifth Avenue during lunch, it's amazing these days how often people are looking down and not up. How often and, and how we, we don't have as many acts. We have, too few, the number of accents I think are going to go up because so many people no longer look up. They look down and they text. You know, I don't know if you have, have you ever had business meetings in Israel or, or even, dare I ask, um, friendly gatherings where four or more people gather around a table and no one looks at each other because everyone's texting? <laughs> I, I, in my family, I call for no device dinners or, you know, uh, NDDs. <laughs> You know, no device dinner is a time where you're actually going to declare in advance, you put your weapons away, and you sit down, and you have something called a conversation. It's really hard, but you might want that because it's those, the, and so, it's, so, so this is part of this overload, this hyper-communication syndrome, which you don't realize you're suffering through, but you are, and that you have just early signs of it. I suffer from it greatly, and my ability to be distracted is high, yet I fight it every day. But when I, when I look at how I communicate with people, you know, I have this radio approach to things. I mean, I'm actually looking at the goodwill. I'm looking at uh, the fact that if I'm not connecting with people, that maybe I'll be lonely again. I mean, how many people here know of ICQ? Everyone, right? All right, ICQ. You know what ICQ stands for? ICQ. I it was built by amateur radio operators, people who understood the fundamentals of being alone. And the whole, the entire instant messaging industry, whether it was private, Private IMs, public IMs, it's all about connecting people with people. And that this social media revolution that gets so much buzz in the news today is nice to be buzzy about. But I think what we're actually experiencing is not that. I actually believe, and time will only tell, but I think we're actually living through a new communication revolution. I think that 
when you look at the evolution of presence. So presence, um, if you ever used ICQ and you know when someone's online or when Yahoo Messenger first let you know what your, your friends were listening to with music, that starts to share a certain presence or what's happening in the online world. And over the last 10 years or so, presence has evolved into a big business. Uh, for anyone here downloads Foursquare yet? You might want to because there's something very uh, clever about what Foursquare does, very simply put. It's a location-based services game that uh, you and your friends can keep track of where you are. So it's one thing to have Facebook status updates about things that are trivial. But you know what? Every once in a while, you go into a place and you want to know what's happening around it or where it's at. And, and this is a, what's significant for this, in my mind, is that it's not a service provider pushing this to you, it's your friends. And that it's, um, it, there's a revolution that's brewing, which I think will have big consequences. And so um, Foursquare happens to be one of the few companies that, that's pushing location-based services. But where, where this is coming to is a little scary, right? We, we are, our privacy is being exposed. Uh, things about our personal life might necessarily may not want to be sharing certain things. But at the same time, we are connecting as people. And that what I think is happening in a very big way is a communication revolution that is something which is uh, not going to be known until 5 or 10 or 15 years from now. But I think that the social networks of Facebook and Twitter and, and Foursquare and other things are primitives in this. And that in the state of now, when you're, when you're, when you're experiencing the real-time internet, see, we, last year I think was sort of the moment in time we, we started transition from an archival internet that's an internet where you go to Google and ask a question to go to, to an internet where you go to places like Twitter and make a statement. I mean, you may not be aware of this, but um, around the world, brands are now listening what consumers have to say. I mean, as scary as it, of course they always should, but I mean, in the world of advertising, in the world of politics, in the world of uh, the media, in the world of uh, advertising, they've all changed. In fact, almost in every major, there's been systemic change in the way businesses operate because of the worldwide adaption of these real-time messaging platforms. Uh, you know, like last summer, last June in Iran, nobody from Twitter went to Tehran to suggest that the dissidents should tweet their, their, their discourse, <coughs> but it happened. Um, most recently in Haiti, um, something crazy happened. Uh, besides the, the tragedy, and I actually was, I was keeping track of the IDF in Haiti, thanks to the Twitter account there. One of my friends that I ended up making last year was Ann Curry. She's a, uh, she is Ann Curry. She's a reporter for NBC News. She's on the Today Show. And... Um, she was, in she was in Haiti, and she put out a tweet that said that Doctors Without Borders um, could not land a plane. And it turned out the U.S. Air Force was in control of the airport in Port-au-Prince. And, and as an amateur radio operator, I should just tell you that I used, what I used to do is relay messages. As a kid, I used to think that I was on the TV show MASH, and I was Raider O'Reilly. And I had the role to, of course, push messages and do phone patches and do all this stuff. And I felt in times of tragedy, or, or at least emergency, I tried to pass messages. So now that I didn't have my ham radio running and Haiti was happening, what can I do? So I was looking to people who I looked up to, or at least people who I looked for, who were on the ground, and how do I help? So, so Ann Curry has put out a message to at U.S. Air Force, that's the Twitter account for the U.S. Air Force. At U.S. Air Force, please let Doctors Without Borders land their plane. Without even reading what she wrote, I didn't actually realize she was shouting out to the U.S. Air Force. I took her message, and I put it on my Twitter account, and it's called retweeting, and I rebroadcast her message. Well, about a minute after I put out that tweet, I got, an act, I, got a, I got a reply from the U.S. Air Force saying, we're on it. I said, okay, think about this. Okay, you put out, so now I'm dealing with the government, U.S. government, and someone at the U.S. Air Force says they're on it. And then an hour later, I got a, a tweet from the U.S. Air Force that this plane had landed. And then I realized, oh my God, I'm now talking to the U.S. Air Force. I have an open hailing frequency to the U.S. Air Force. What can you do with that? And so I ended up uh, connecting with the Air Force and uh, emailing, and, 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 I, and I wanted to invite them to a conference I'm doing in April in New York City. And um, anyway, so I invited them. They said they'll come, send, email so and so. And before I even thought about it, I'm now emailing someone in the U.S. Pentagon about a conference. And it turns out that the U.S. government has a Twitter team at the Air Force, and that um, and they they are actually coming to my conference. And that I felt very connected in a very weird kind of way. That. You have this openness and this, you know, the thing was, after, during 9-11 in America, in New York City, one of the takeaways is that the police department, the fire department, the FBI, the ambulances, people in public safety, 
none of them could talk to each other. Why? It wasn't because of mechanics. It's just that everyone used different frequencies. The radios for one, pro for one emergency group wasn't on the same channel as the other. And the big thing that happened in Haiti is everybody was on the same channel. It was called Twitter. And I don't know whether or not this is a magical moment in time that will go away, but the fact that all these discrete groups of people from the IDF to, to people in the Dominican Republic to people across the, the world trying to affect change, it all happened on Twitter real fast. Um, these days in the media, there's a term I, I created called, I call it now media. I, I've lost millions of dollars investing in new media companies. I don't advise investing in new media companies. But I discovered that new media will never, ever replace old media. But if you take old media companies, fuse them together with, with uh, new media companies, you get now media. And that's something which Twitter has been very influential for. I, I'm sure you've all heard of Susan Boyle. If you want to know why in eight days Susan Boyle went from being very obscure to an Oprah, it happened because of Twitter. Because in eight days, the, on, on, over the weekend, uh, Britain's Got Talent puts out her video. She, they end up, gets discovered by the internet nerds. A million people watch it. We cry. We love it. And then that becomes newsworthy. And then, then there's a, 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 a cycle of the news putting out as, as different millions of people watch this video. Other people discover it. And then on Twitter, uh, Susan Boyle was the number one, two, or three trending topic for a week, eight days actually. And, she, and the eighth, on, on the eighth day, she was on Oprah. And it, that's the world we're living in, that, that we can affect change immediately. When, we, when people were trying to raise money to Haiti, you know, Wycliffe John actually invented what I call flash money. It's one thing to have flash mobs, but with, uh, with Wycliffe, he, he, he told people that if you want to you know, donate $5, here's a, here's a short code. On going your text, text you know, uh, a word to this code and five dollars be donated. Then Twitter was used actually to promote that. Overnight, four hundred thousand dollars was raised. The U.S. Uh, Red Cross found out about this and they raised ten million dollars. Mm -hmm. And then, and and there's a, so in the in the world that we're living, the intimate world that we're living in now, we have the ability to affect change in a very very meaningful way. And the state of now is something which is something the real time internet. I think represents a great future for many people in terms of what, what, what can happen. You, know, you, may not be wanna, you may not really want to be connected with so many people. You may not really care about people's updates. But socially, it's very hard right now to, to refuse friendships. It may, may be difficult to figure out what's going to happen. But I'll, I'll just leave you with the idea that you know, we are at the very early stages of a communication revolution that we've never seen before. What's evolving is, is how nonverbal communication <coughs> will happen. You know, right now, and it turns out, by the way, that unlike voice over IP, when I used to go to the government, I've actually testified in Congress and stuff. You know, whenever I used to go to Washington, D.C., there are always were lobbyists, people, evil people, lobbyists. And <laughs> these lobbyists would find rules and regulations that were invented 100 years before this technology and figure out the reason why voice over IP should not be allowed to be used. And they were very clever. And I'm very happy to say they almost always lost. In Washington today, I, there's no one fighting Facebook's proliferation. There's nobody, face, there's nobody fighting Twitter. There's nobody fighting Foursquare. So uh, in my own mind, that means there's no industry that, that social media represents. It represents everything. As much as the air, the, the wind, the sky, the sun, there's social media. But what's more interesting to me is the evolution of what happens next in terms of the technologies that change and, ha and the opportunities that are presented because we, we have these platforms. And so when you think about, when you, when you share something on Facebook right now, that connects people with people and there's a certain message shared. But in the future, I think those types of messages are going to trigger many large communications to happen. And you know, what was meaningful to me is you know, having 350,000 people follow what I tweet about is kind of unreal. Um, but it has its powers. You see, about a year ago I did a conference in New York City. I had no staff. And I needed, I drove my car, my car, I had 18 boxes in my car. I needed help unloading for my conference. So what, do you, what would you do if you needed help in, your, in a city and you wanted people to volunteer to help you? What would you do? Any idea? Any suggestion? Call friends. Call, call friends? What if, you, but what if you don't know where they are? Well, okay, so I put out a tweet. I said, uh, any friends near 340 West 50th Street around 3 o'clock, could you please help me unload some boxes? <laughs> Guess what happened? Uh, eight, eight, I got there at 3.07. Eight random strangers were waiting for me. 
They unloaded my boxes in 10 minutes. Six random strangers stayed for three and a half hours to help me collate the badges for the conference. And, and this is like, oh my God, this, and this is what I'm talking about in terms of this, this empowering, you know, social revolution. Anyone and everyone has an opportunity. You know, when I fly, I fly a lot. People may think it's kind of weird. I might put in my Facebook status, but the flights are mine. The reason I'm doing that is to allow random strangers to share coffee or have tea. And it's amazing what happens when, when you actually connect people. And it's that same, you know, in, in a world that's so cold, Two big words I learned how to spell last year, humanity and serendipity. There's something about the human experience that if you let yourself be a little bit vulnerable, if you let yourself feel a little bit of emotion and share a little bit of emotion, it takes you far and deep. And at the conferences I put together about the state of now, I, was, I actually was crying each and every one of them. There's some very deep emotional feelings. One of my friends, who I wish was here alone, he, he, my friend wrote, I uh, created at the hotel. He created a Twitter account for people to send prayers to, to, the, to, the, to the hotel. And the stories that he shares about people from around the world, from all religions, uh, being able to pass messages through Twitter to the hotel, it, it will bring tears to the most hardened person's face. I'm sorry. But it, there's just a, love, a level of love that's there, and the opportunity to connect is just unreal. So um, I, I just, we never had that before. Email didn't give it to me into messaging to give it to me. But I think that <coughs> when the world is listening and then the opportunity to connect people with people, anything and everything is happening. And so, you know, for me, there's a social communication revolution at the, at the early stages of, if you, know, if you happen to be an entrepreneur and you're trying to make the next billion dollars, I think if you try to figure out a piece of what I'm talking about and make some sense to it, I think it's unbounded in terms of what's happening because the internet the real-time internet to me is much bigger in magnitude of value and, and open, openness than the first phase, the, the archival internet was. And that when you, when you, if you can figure, help to connect some dots, um, great things will happen in front of you. So anyway, that's sort of what I wanted to cover. Um, if you are on Twitter or, or just download it, I'm at Jeff Pulver. I'm Jeff Pulver on Facebook. Um, I'm Jeff at Pulver.com for email. And if maybe if, if you have a question or two, I'll be happy to take it. But I want to thank you for listening. I, I hope that you have a chance to participate in your own communication revolution. And uh, if you have any ideas or opinions about where things go, please don't be too shy. But thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, in the middle, yes? Yes. How do you think people will communicate uh, 100 years uh, from today? Uh, telepathy. Um, <laughs> Next, anyone? I'm not kidding. I think that, because right now, if you think about things, sometimes they happen. Well, you know, telepathy over IP should be an, an, it should be an innovation. Someone here should invent it, you know? You should be able to capture the bio rhythms of a mind and broadcast it over the internet and feel things. Why not? You know, yes? Uh, we'll see what's, what's happening actually with uh, the microblogging, the real time communication, but we also see that the corporate world is definitely taking advantage of it. So what do you think is, uh, will it have any influence of you know, the sort of the freedom spirit that you're talking about? Um, the freedom spirit and the corporate world are two fight, fighting parties that will always be at war. Um, you know, in, in America, and I can't speak about Israel, but in the U.S., one of the, new, one of the direct impacts of social media on corporations is the recent hiring of chief, chief listening officers. Uh, American Express recently had 15 executives listened to what people were saying about American Express for six months, and now they have five people in the company dedicated to that. Kodak has a chief listening officer. So companies are listening to what's being said of them and of their competition. What's happening because of this freedom of, of expression is the adoption of policy. Uh, the, the, the U.S. Army has a policy, the National Football League has a policy, ESPN has a policy, and a lot of times they think they can shut you up. Hollywood is scared out of their minds about this because it turns out that the viral buzz of the people make or break movies now faster than ever before. You know, Avatar made it to a billion dollars real fast. They had positive buzz. But if you're an up-and-coming studio, uh, if you're an actor or an actress in Hollywood and you signed a contract at a major studio, you actually have a no-tweeting policy, most likely. It's only the independent movie guys that are actually letting those voices be heard. So... It turns out there are gatekeepers in every profession. There are gatekeepers no matter where you go, and the people in charge 
don't like the three words of fear, greed, and disruption. People like keeping things the way they were, and to the extent that there's a balance, you know, microblogging, I'm not even sure what that is anymore. But I, I do think real-time communication gives us a voice to affect change in a very big way. And that the companies that adopt an openness, you know, again, it's, it's, everything is very specific. I mean, there are reasons why we have policies to protect the public. You know, we don't want to have medical companies, we want to have um, medicine companies, pharma pharmacy companies doing things and saying things that are just not true. And we have to be very protective about what's being said. But if I didn't have to worry about all these disclosures. Um, I do think that the um, openness of having a platform scares everybody. You know, Ashton Kutcher has four and a half or five million people following him. That means that he's more powerful than any studio that will ever hire him. And as, as artists, um, uh, and here in Israel I'm happy to see some of the artists that go online, they become powerful, more powerful than the record labels because the shift is going from them directly to the fans. And that's scary if you're the person who put millions of dollars into building these artists up. And so this power shift is something which is a power struggle. And the, uh, while the people may be empowered now, you know, there's always a chance the empire will return. Uh, any other yes, over here? Um, you're talking about the power shift. So money is money. That's what that's my question actually. So you know, how do you how do you justify the values of Facebook and Twitter? Well, I happen to be an investor in Twitter. Uh, I got in the V round. Um, but I actually invested because I use the platform. I believe Twitter is worth billions and billions of dollars because you see it turns out that if you actually are the network that has that has changed the face of advertising, the media, um, uh, politics, uh, you, you tell me, real estate, education. I mean, education, get, um, how, how, do you like, how would you like to be a student or a parent these days? Three years ago, my, uh, my, kids at, my, go, my kids go to a private day school in Long Island. Facebook was banned in the K-12 school. Now it's used, actually. The teachers use Facebook to connect with, the, with, the, with, the, with both the students and the parents. And, if, and the teachers at this school go on Twitter and connect with other educators from around the world. And this is a much different world than just three years. So in terms of money, if you happen to own the infrastructure that connects all this and own, and you can make these widgets and do all these various things, you know, you, you, the money is there by far. It's just it's, it's, worth, it's billions and billions of dollars that, of, the, of the real value. I mean, you may not have been there, but during the U.S. inauguration, everybody in the media, whether you are in, in newspapers, in magazines, on radio, on TV, Every anchor, every producer said, follow me on Twitter. Twitter could not handle the publicity of what, what happened, but as a result of it, it, while each individual news anchor was building their own personal brand, collectively it just put, put Twitter that much more powerful as a force in the media. And that the magazines now, uh, print magazines, newspapers, use Twitter as a platform to hear what people have to say and they react to it. In terms of valuation, um, you know, how much do you put, how, how do you value your ability to actually know what your customers are saying and doing? You know, how, how do you value the ability to react to problems immediately? How do you, you know, how do you value the ability to actually have this two-way two -way communication across multiple disciplines? It's uh, priceless, I believe. Uh, and so, there, there's, uh, there's more money that will be made through Twitter and through, uh, Facebook, on the other hand, has a big problem. It's a philosophical problem. On the, po on the positive side, Facebook has become the 400 million person direct living directory of everyone on the internet. And that if you understand how powerful and valuable it is that almost anyone alive who has internet connectivity can be discovered, that's tremendously powerful. Except Facebook, for some reason, is hung up on being Twitter. But fundamentally, Facebook is closed. There's privacy controls. And that you post your photos, you post your, you have your friend relationships, it's all closed. Twitter by default is to the public and it's open. One is not the other. Um, if you just understand that if you were Facebook, if you were to focus on delivering any, from advertising on down and better services to your community, they, they'll do well. I, I could justify Facebook being worth 10 or 15 billion dollars, and I could justify Twitter's valuation more. Only because, you know, Twitter right now, is, they reported last week that there's 600 tweets a second coming out. That means there are 50 million tweets a day. And that's up from some phenomenal growth just a few months ago. You know, when the world tweets together, you know, and again, this is happening autonomously. 
you know, for school teachers to discover Twitter as a platform for each other to start doing curriculum programming on, or for real estate agents to start using this, or people at Madison Avenue, or people, or politicians, you know, one of the biggest problems, frankly, with social media is when it's used and, there's, and it's being, being done non-transparently. You know, in America, we have a president that won the presidency on YouTube and won the presidency maybe because of social media. And the reality is that if President uh, um, Obama doesn't wait, waits until he's up for re-election to go back to using social media, he will lose. Mm -hmm. And that goes for any politician. It's one thing to be used as a tool, but the moment the public realizes that they were used, they will not allow it to happen again. Because the, one of the things that happened through this revolution there's, there's a level of transparency and accountability. The email, you have spam. You don't know who's sending you that spam. On social media, supposedly, you do know who you're connecting with, and it's very powerful. So if you happen to own the network, that's the voice for politicians, the voice for news gathering. Because understand, you know, when, when, when the major, in the last seven months um, that I was tracking, news breaks first on Twitter than anywhere else. Uh, anybody here ever work in finance? So arbitrage, right? You know about arbitrage? How would you like it if you had a 40-minute gap? There was a 40-minute gap two earthquakes ago in, in California that was reported on Twitter and then reported on news.google.com. 40 minutes. You want to be a broker. You want to be the broker. Well, that's what's happening in the real-time internet is that the arbitrage information is there. What you, how you gather it is up to you but it's sitting there to be taken advantage of. And so it's all there. So if you happen to be that network that reports that, it is priceless. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.